did you see who the guest is tonight? No, who is it? Yeah, who? Mark Graney. No way, that guy loves dogs. Yeah, he does. We're going to ask him. His favorite breed. You mean besides his own dogs? What the heck is a Catahoula Leopard Dog? I never trust any breed that has cat as part of its name. Leopard too. What are you going to ask him, Bella? I want to know why it takes seven years for him to write a book. Uh-oh. I'm busted. Goodness. Ah, oh, man. I tell you what. Turn your back for one second. So our guest tonight is Mark Greeny. He is the best-selling author of The Gray Man. Came out about 10 years ago, and shortly after that, he signed a multi-book deal, and he never looked back. Along the way, he collaborated with Tom Clancy on three Jack Ryan novels, and after the late, great Clancy passed away, Grady continued the series with four more Jack Ryan books. This year, in addition to his best-selling Mission Critical, he collaborated with Lieutenant Colonel Rip Rawlings on Red Metal, one of the best military thrillers in at least a decade. We are really, really thrilled to have Mark Graney. I want to thank Mark Graney for coming on tonight and being so generous with his time. Go to markgraneybooks.com to check out information on all of his books. And stay tuned for February 18th, 2020, when One Minute Out hits the bookshelves. We'll see you next Monday on the Crew Reviews Podcast. Well, I, I made a drink because I've watched you guys before, so I had to have, have a drink ready. It's the only way to survive this, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> so we're thrilled to have Mark Graney with us tonight. Welcome up, welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks so much. Hey, hey guys, Ooh. I really appreciate it. It's good to be here. Well, I'm going to start right into uh, to your whole catalog. Um, I've made no secret with these guys that my favorite current protagonist is Court Gentry, a.k.a. Violator, a.k.a. The Gray Man. Um, so what I want to know is what inspired you to create Court and how did you differentiate him from the other protagonists in the genre? Um, I was inspired originally. So I wrote a, a book called Goon Squad in 2006 and I wrote it for the guy who's now my agent, Scott Miller. Um, I had given him another book book that I had written that I was very proud of and he liked it but he just he said it was just way too ambitious for somebody who's never been published before and and all that and he said if you can I mean I love it when a, an agent or an editor gives you like fi a five second sound bite of advice and you're like all right I can work with that that's so much better than them spending a whole weekend with you and giving you all this <laughs> yeah. sage wisdom and, but he literally said he's like if you can write you know, he's like, you write great action or whatever. And he said, if you, you can write a, a book where on the cover, you'd have like a guy with a gun, you know, silhouette of a guy with a gun. And that's the book, you know, he's like, you can probably, you, you're good enough to get published, you know, just like keep it simple for your first outing and all that. So I was like, all right, who's my protagonist? And so I sort of had this idea. Um, I was in El Salvador, or yeah, El Salvador in 2006. And, um, and I, saw this American guy in a bar and there were some Americans down there. I was down there studying language and there were, you know, like stoners and surfers and <laughs> people that you see in like really cheapo, uh, you know, it's like eat everything you want, drink everything you want. Your cab comes to like $4 and you're laying in a hammock all day. You know, it was, it was that kind of a place. And um, there was just a guy at, at sitting at this bar uh, and he was American because I heard him talk, but he didn't look like anybody else. He didn't look like the other Americans. He was a little bit older, you know, like probably well into his thirties and, uh, you know, kind of like beard and mustache. And I just was just sitting there by myself and I just created this whole backstory for this guy, not even saying I'm going to write a book about him. It was just sort of like, you know, what's this dude's story. Yeah. And so I was like, all right, he's CIA, but he's, he has to live off grid because you know, he's they're after him, but it'd be cool if he didn't know why. And it's also, you know, a, a writing device if I you know I don't have to think of a reason why in book one <laughs> they're after him either so um so th that that was the original inception you asked how he's different I think um from the beginning I wanted to make him a little more vulnerable than a lot of the other big uh you know like sort of action book guys um he gets hurt more he's uh less sure of himself he makes more mistakes um that sort of thing. I, I always wanted him to be like uh, maybe three fifths Jason Bourne and two fifths John McClane from Die Hard. Who's just, right. who's just barely making it, you know, 
from one room to the next, you know, with, with running over broken glass or whatever, you know, it's, yeah. it's not like he's just, you know, suave and debonair and he's just like, just smoking everybody. It's more like he's just barely hanging on. So that, that was kind of, you know, and, I, and I've stuck with that through the series. He's probably even more vulnerable now and more, you know, prone to that sort of stuff. So over the course, Mark, of the, uh, the adventures you've put Court on, um, how hard is it for you to come up with new challenges for him? Um, and where do you draw your inspiration for what you're going to do for each novel um, once you get going? It gets harder and harder. Um, I thought it would get easier, <laughs> as you write. You know, it was like, well, I should be able to crank these out by now. But, I, you know, once you've told all the stories that you can think of, you know, that you, that you had in your head, and right. they come from different places. I, um, I think the second book in the, in the great, so the first book was, you know, all my idea. And it was just this story about a, a gaunt, you know, like the, this hero, like uh, facing this gauntlet of, um, of kill teams from around the world. And, uh, and then the second book, it was actually my, my agent. He was talking about, you know, what was going on in Darfur and the genocide and all this other stuff. He's like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in, in the first book, Gray Man's like in, you know, the middle of Europe, he's in Paris and all this other stuff. It's like, what if you threw him into like Sudan or something like that? And so I was like, okay. And then I ran off and, and wrote a book after six months. The third book was about the Mexican, you know, drug cartels. And the fourth book was, uh, the fourth book I thought was kind of, I want, I needed to do something different. Um, I was working with Clancy at that point too. So my books were sort of expanding more espionage and less just straight action thrillers. And um, there was there was this idea in the fourth book that he's he's met a guy who's trained the same way he is and all this other stuff, but this guy's a psychopath. And so there's this uh, you know sort of hmm. battle of wits and all that. So each one each story comes from a different place, um, and I, I, it's super important for me to make the books unique. You know, people want the same thing, but different. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and that's not easy, but I, I'm, I'm a reader first and foremost as well. And I want the same thing, but different from authors as well. So I'm always trying to do different stuff. My next gray man book is the first one I did. I've done where the gray man's in the first person. So you actually hear his thoughts and whatnot. And um, I may never do it again, but I wanted to do something different and mm -hmm. give the book a different feel. Hmm. Did you get any pushback trying to do it that way or were you, or was it suggested? Just curious. It was my idea originally. And I sort of chickened out like three books in a row, like for three books in a row, <laughs> I said I was going to do it. And then as I started writing the first part, I was just kind of like, Oh, that's going to be hard to get here. So I, 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 I didn't do it. And then, um, this last book, I was pretty much committed to it. And then, um, I, it's probably not great to mention books that haven't come out yet, but um, the Don Bentley book without sanction. I don't know if any of you guys have read that yet. Um, not yet. It's, it comes out in, <laughs> I, sorry, Don, this is the worst plug in history. I don't know when your book comes out. <laughs> I, I'm going to say next spring, but anyway, I, I was already committed to do first person and I wanted to do it in a very sort of not unique way, but in a very sort of way where the first person, the guys, the, the court's thoughts are very communicative with the reader. It's, it's, it's more almost like he's talking to you. And, uh, and I read Bentley's book and he did, he didn't do that, but he did sort of a unique first person, like a very sort of like inside, uh, it's hard to explain, but when I read that, I was just like, all right, this is, you know, he did it. He, he executed it. I, I, I think I can do this. I so, can do this. Yeah. 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 So it, it, it's fun. And then my editor said when he read it, he was like, I'll be honest with you. I've been scared about this for a long time. But he's like, <laughs> I, I think you pulled it off. So thank you. Cool. Yeah, you were talking about all the different locations that Court's been to uh, over the course of the series so far. Um, have you always traveled to the places that uh, uh, as, as research, or has that grown over the over the years in terms of you getting to the same locations? How has how's that kind of um, transpired? Almost every book I've done research travel for in one way or another. The book that takes place in Sudan part of it takes place in Ireland and I went to Ireland and I did not go to the Sudan. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and when I worked with Clancy books, I didn't go to North Korea, uh, but I've been to, you know, Russia and China and, and um, Algeria and, and lots of different places. Um, the, the, one of the gray man books, gunmetal gray, which was the sixth book, I think um, was, it took place in Vietnam and yeah. Thailand. And these are places. Well, there we go. There, there you go. Got yeah. a picture. Yeah, right. yeah. Well, I got one Good right book. here. That's awesome. I've got one somewhere. Um, <laughs> Let's hope so I have a stack somewhere. Um, 
but that one, I, yeah, I had this huge trip plan and I like to scuba dive and I was excited. I was going to like, you know, go to Phuket and scuba dive and all this. I was just there. Were you really? Yeah. Jerk. No, Beautiful. I'm just kidding. Um, Beautiful. No, it was, the whole <laughs> thing right. fell You're through. Right. I had to have ankle surgery. And so I literally wrote every word from, of Gunmetal Gray, like on a couch with my leg elevated, you know, and like going to the kitchen in a knee scooter, you know, this is totally yeah. not <laughs> a sexy thing at all. I, but I'd been to Hong Kong and I'd been to China. And I sort of used places as stand-ins, yeah. you know, for for the locations. But I really wanted to go to the, those places so bad. But every other trip, um, this uh, one minute out, my next Gray Man book that comes out uh, in February, I, I went to Bosnia and Croatia and Italy and to Los Angeles, all for research for the book. Uh, the Croatia yeah. pictures uh, put oh, that really stunning. high on our vacation list. Oh my gosh, it's so nice it's so there, beautiful. and and I really enjoyed Bosnia. I didn't, you know, know what to think, but I, 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 I it was a great experience. Hmm. Awesome. So, um, you mentioned that you didn't go to Suzanne, but you went to Ireland. What factors? And and this this doesn't just apply to travel. This applies to usage of firearms, usage of any other you know contraptions. What factors drive for you, whether you do real world research or if you're comfortable doing the digital or paper research? Honestly, opportunity and, and time, you know, t- availability. And I've been, at, I've been offered so many amazing opportunities that I just haven't been able to do um, because of, you know, time. I'm always, you know, I've done two books a year, just about since 2009. Um, and so I don't get to do as much stuff as I want. Um, but I do as much as I can. And then every now and then, you know, forces align and I'm able to go to this, you know, like long range shooting school in Virginia or something like, you know, that weekend works out or, um, so I've, I've been afforded a lot of amazing opportunities and probably four times more opportunities. Um, I haven't been able to do, I did, uh, a friend of mine just asked me if I wanted to go to the Dayton air show next year. And he has all this sort of like back access to, all these aircrafts and all this stuff like that. And I'm like, of course I do. I, I can't commit right now. You know, it's like, it'd be the easiest thing to commit to in the world, but I, I, I have to figure out where things are falling with, with due dates and all that sort of stuff. Um, hopefully, hopefully I'll get to do that. So I do as much as I can in the time that I have. And, um, and I really don't think about the expense <laughs> to my own detriment. Uh, I wrote this book, Red Metal, which I see over uh, uh, Sean's right shoulder there because he's, he's uh, the large screen here. Right here. Um, yeah, it's, uh, and that book I wrote with an active duty Marine, Marine Lieutenant Colonel, and he and I went to Poland and to Germany and to France and, and um, out to Nellis Air Force Base. We did all this stuff, and there was this day in Germany where we needed to go up and talk to this general and we needed to go all the way down to the to the, the German Alps and do all this other stuff. And it was literally, we just, you know, like hiked over to the train station, bought tickets, right? That, you know, it was like no Eurail pass. There was no anything. <laughs> we went to the north of the country. We went down to Munich and then we went to the south of the country all in the same day. And I was like, if I looked and saw what I paid, you know, just to, <laughs> just to travel us around. So that happens sometimes, but uh, yeah, it, it makes the book better. And you just figure like, you know, your job is to write a good book and, and, and do it in the whatever way. Works. Yeah. So we all know all of us here that the internet has created a massive amount of experts and just about every <laughs> thing known to man. Yeah. Do you, do you have a line in the sand where you, where literary creativity versus you know, quote unquote research kind of happens. Is there a spot where you just say, okay, this is enough. This is where I'm, I, I'm going to call in my chit and say, this is literary creativity and not just pure research driven. Is there a, is, is there a point where you just kind of lean that direction? You mean as far as like getting accuracy and in, in Yeah. You know, or? you can only go so far, right? Before right. Yeah, you, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's less important to me than it was. What I, I caught myself doing a few books into, that's a really good question. Um, I, I need to, I need to go see a therapist about this uh, <laughs> or, or, or just hang out with you guys. Talk so, to thanks us, Mark. Yeah. He's going to say, I asked the good question guys. You- <laughs> oh no. All right. All right. Now, now I'm going to be challenged to like compliment yeah. everybody's question. Um, no, um, I, I, I realized a few books into my career as once I started working with Clancy and once you, you know, you went from getting like two or three emails a day from people that like, or don't like your book to, 35 to 50, you know, when it Jeez. comes out and that sort of stuff. Um, I realized that a lot, some of the stuff I was putting in books like detail was to cover my ass. Right. <laughs> and it wasn't to make the story better. 
Hmm. Um, it was basically like, well, they're going to ask why he didn't transition to his pistol. So I have to write this whole paragraph about how, you know, <laughs> and now sometimes that's good. You know, sometimes yeah. that can be cool and add yeah. to the verisimilitude of the story and all that stuff. But then I just caught myself going like, oh, there's going to be that guy that, you know, I got an email from a guy once of all my mistakes and um, the guy's like beached a boat with an outboard motor. And I didn't say that they took the outboard motor and put it in the boat, you know? And, uh, and, and then, so then I said, th- you're just idiots, you know? And I'm like, I, you know what? And I, and I, re- I wrote the guy back cause sometimes I'm a jerk and, and I wrote the guy back and I was like, he didn't go to the bathroom once in 10 days. Did you notice that? Um, <laughs> that's improbable. Uh, but, but, but then I, I, I sort of caught myself in final drafts of in books that are out there, there's detail in there that was just to get people so people wouldn't bug me on the internet, you know, like on email yeah. and stuff like that. And then when I when I realized that's what I was doing, then I was like, all right, does it serve the story to add that stuff in there? And there's so many things that don't matter. There's so many um, uh, things where I'll go to a location, I'll be like, all right, this is. Um, and I, I, I wrote this book, Agent in Place, and this girl, th- these people try and uh, kidnap this, or, or Court actually kidnaps this, uh, this fashion model from this house in Paris. Um, and I, I went to the place where Kim Kardashian was like robbed at gunpoint, like a real exclusive place or whatever. And I skulked all around and all this other <laughs> stuff. And there wasn't a balcony where I needed there to be a balcony, but there is in the book and I don't care. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like the book needs there to be a balcony because it's a cool scene, you know, and he, he jumps off the balcony. And so um, I, I put it there. So, so I, I don't, you know, if you get like slavish to, you know, maps and, and, and specifics or whatever, it, it, it does kind of hurt the story. You want to get it as right as you can. Um, right. And I don't like mm-hmm. it when people like hassle me about little things that I didn't mention. I, I'll tell one more story. This guy, sometimes you, sometimes I catch myself going like, you know what, this, this guy really enjoys criticizing me. And I guess that's just <laughs> sort of a service I provide if he, buy, if he buys my book. So I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll let him do it. And I'll do, You're I'll a therapist his, after yeah, all. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, there was a guy who wrote this thing, one of the Clancy books. And, and it's like, you had, uh, you know, you said that Dominic was in Las Vegas with these guys. And then in the next scene, he's, or, or you know, like in some action happened in one part. And then he joined the, the other guys. Uh, up in Boston or something and it's like how did he get from Las Vegas to Boston and so I, I uh, emailed the guy back and I said he won a trip on Wheel of Fortune <laughs> and, uh, and I, I just could picture that guy like looking through the book going how did I miss that what was the puzzle he solved <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, what was the puzzle he solved and, and to me it was, it was just it was just this thing this guy's like hey I caught you not saying that Dominic went to join the other guys. It's like, there's all sorts of things I don't tell you in books. And hey, hey Mark, like, Mark, I'm curious, uh, like with each book, how many, how many uh, comments do you think you get like that? D- uh, dozens and dozens, not hundreds. Red Metal, I got a lot more because Red Metal is, is very detail oriented. It has a lot yeah. to do with weapon system. Right. 217,000 word. But I, this, is, this is my line that I've been using for the Clancy stuff. It's like, you know, in a 200,000 word book, I'm sorry, but there's going to be about 10 words that, I'll, that I'd like to have back <laughs> a do yeah, over on. To know? blame Tom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and that's what people say. They'll be, if they, they don't want to blame me. They'll be like, your proofreader should have caught it. And it's every word that goes in there is, is up to me. And I always think if the proofreaders don't catch it, it's because I gave them a thousand things to fix instead of a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> and if I only gave them a hundred, they'd have probably caught it. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm responsible for every word. Um, red metal, there's not a, a lot of, I don't think there's a lot of, of errors, but there's a couple of like, you know, like uh, an A-10 uh, Warthog does not have an afterburner on, in its engines. And at one point yeah. we, we say that there's an afterburner. <laughs> we don't say there's an afterburner. Like it was a big plot point. It was just yeah. kind of like, you know, he turned and after, you know, hit out, or whatever. And it, and it just, uh, you know, Rip missed it. I missed it. I probably wrote, it's funny. This is Rip and I did that book so together that we're both like fighting each over over who did it. Like, I feel like I'm like, that sounds exactly like something I would write and not think about it. He's like, no, I think I remember writing it and all this. And it's like, so we're going to argue about which one of us screwed up, which is better than us, you know, trying to blame the other guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah I would rip that email about the warthog, I guess you got this one wrong. Buddy. <laughs> yeah. Did you use a fake name? Um, that's no, a, I'll, uh, I'll get Mark, that that's perfect I'll, segue into the next question about, yeah. um, about this book, uh, that you wrote with rip. Um, so, but before this, you wrote several titles with, with Clancy. Mm-hmm. 
And, uh, you know, he's like, he's like kind of the author that everybody read that got into the genre first. Yeah. Tom Clancy's <laughs> like the it guy. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm curious, was there any advice that Tom gave you that you believe made you a better writer? Um, sure. I mean, you know, as far as specific advice, you know, I, I just, like, I remember like our conversations and I remember like really specific things that just Clancy's mind just works at a different level than other people's or, or it did until he sadly passed away. But, you know, he would, I would say something and he'd be like, Oh no, the, 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 the Chinese are buying their, their jet engines from France and blah, 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 blah. You know, so, so there was, yeah. there was a little bit of that stuff and you're like, Oh, okay. Um, how do you know that? Um, <laughs> but, but really those years where I wrote the Clancy books, it sort of taught me to write, to write deeper and wider in the story. And it also taught me to not dumb things down for readers, which I never thought readers were dumb in the first place, but I had sort of a tendency to over explain things. Mm -hmm. And the Clancy stories were such big stories with so many things, so many moving parts or whatever. Um, I, I went back and, you know, would read Clancy books. Um, I learned more from reading Tom Clancy than I did from having Tom Clancy say, you know, you need to mm -hmm. you know, write, you know, like more, excuse me, um, more this way or more that way. Um, there wasn't a lot of that in our relationship, but it was definitely, uh, you know, like going back to those books, I'm like, okay, so he doesn't over explain this. He just puts you here and then he does this. So, um, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience for me. It's, ma it's made me a better writer. It's made me longer winded. Um, which I guess anybody that works with Clancy <laughs> is going to get pulled into a little bit. My, my gray man books are one 160,000 words now. Jeez. Yeah. Did you pass on anything to rip? Did, did I pass on advice to rip? Oh, I yeah, was, kind of I like was, in that same vein. Um, yeah. I mean, I was, I was always, you know, telling him things. He would send me chapters and I would send him chapters and we would talk and, and, um, and, you know, it, like we had a book tour together and, and this, so people will just assume that, He's the military expert that told me all about the weapon systems and the tactics. And I'm <laughs> the author that wrote all the cool stuff, you know, like that, you know, <laughs> that put this story together and it couldn't be further from the truth. He, he took the first crack at large swaths of this book, 50% or more, maybe more than 50%. And, and I would go back and, and like mix it in with my stuff or, you know, like change it here or edit it here. Um, and then he would take my stuff and he'd look at it and he would, he would, so it was this complete thing. So hopefully he learned something in the process. You know, it, it, it wasn't my, my goal to like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to make rip a better writer for the future. <laughs> I just wanted this book to be as good as possible. But I mean, I, rem I remember telling him earlier on, I'm like, you know, this is, you know, if you have a, uh, you know, a fixed mindset, then, then I write the way I do and you write the way you do. And we're going to slap this stuff together or we can have this sort of like, you know, Thing where we want this voice to be you know this better than the sum of its parts yeah kind of building on chris's question <clears throat> um being mentored by clancy he asked you if you if it made you a better writer I'm, I'm asking this because i learned a lot this is a really weird segue but i, I learned a lot about football by coaching football more sure. than i did as a player yeah so as you mentored rip did you find out things about did, did you develop as a writer through mentorship. Yeah, I, I, I hesitate to say I mentored Rip because he's a good writer and he's a brilliant guy. And, um, and I do think that I put my stuff on there and I do, you know, I couldn't have written the book without him and he couldn't have written the book without me. So, um, but it does help me, but it, it's funny when you said, as you started to say that I, I had to smile because I was thinking that I, there were lots of times where I would be talking to Rip and I would be telling, I, I wasn't really explaining myself very well. And I was so mad at myself for blowing off seventh grade English grammar <laughs> and all that, you know, so I, was not, I, was, I speak at school sometimes and I'm always like, I was bad in English. And that sounds like, hey, you can still be a number one New York Times bestselling author if you're bad in English. It's like, it hurts me every day. It would have been so easy for me to like pay a little of attention then. But there's, there's times with, with, you know, with Rip where it's like, oh, I just want to explain to him about you know, how I think my voice here and his voice here, you know, like grammatically don't, aren't meshing. So we have to like fix it. And um, my buddy, uh, Josh Hood, who's also an author, um, you, you guys might know. Yeah, him. we know. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love uh, one of Brilliant my writer, actually. Yeah. And he, and, he, and he lives very close to me. And, and um, 
and all that. But he and I were, were talking, I was, I was lamenting to him that like, I wish I knew grammar better to like be able to articulate some of the, the things that I feel. And uh, he and I had had this plan that we were going to wear these little disguises and we were going to go take a, a grammar class at the local <laughs> university, you know, because we didn't want anybody to know that, that it was us because it was... You can't it, show up there. It, it would make us look better. I just bought a bunch of books on um, outlining novels and all this other stuff, you know, like outlining for dummies and stuff like that. I just bought that. I'm like... Yeah, I, I don't know that I want people to know that. Of course, I just said it to you guys. So the guy who wrote this <laughs> is going out. Is going on for sure. Yeah. yeah. You, know, I mean, always, books. You, you can always learn. You can always learn. What, yeah. What's funny about that is when I was in college, I actually had, had started freelancing, uh, writing magazines. And um, uh-huh. I, I had a really good run my freshman year. I had like something like 13 articles published. You're like, this and is And my um, English teacher was like, listen, this is never going to get published. The stuff you're putting in here. And he's like, he's lecturing me on what he's going to get published. And I said, and I won't say his name, but I'll say, uh, Mr. X, um, what, how many times have you been published this year? He said, well, I have to publish every two years. I'm like, okay, so let me ask you again. How many times have you been published this year? He said, well, I got published once. I'm like, and I, and I opened up my folder and I pulled out seven articles and I gave it to him. I'm like, you know, what, what is taught isn't always what's yeah. real. And, yeah. and and you have to, you as a fiction writer, you know that it's like I mean, right? Grammar is yeah. important, but by the same token, storytelling. Most of the stuff. If if you turned in a lot of your stories, there'd be some college professor that would. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. In fact, I was rege- I tried to get into a writing workshop. Um, a kind of a well-known um, author, more of a southern author, because I live in the south. I live in Memphis. Um, was teaching this this writing workshop at University of Memphis here, and I was, uh, I I tried out for it. And, uh, you know, like I, I gave a submission and it was a submission of work that was part of Gray Man. And I got a very kind rejection letter that it just <laughs> wasn't, you know, it wasn't the quality there. I don't, he didn't say that. I mean, it, but whatever. It, it was a rejection letter, no matter what he said. And a friend of mine, um, my friend Karen, tried out for it as well. And she's a magazine editor and she's written more stuff than I have probably. And uh, she was rejected too. So um, I don't know. And, and that, and that author, although he's pretty well known, um, I I don't think he's put out 19 books in the last 10 years. Like, I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, know, but that does, I don't want to like, I wish I did study writing more. I think it would help me. And I, and I do read books on on it. um, And and I've, I've been really behind schedule with, with writing projects for a couple of years. And now that I'm, digging out of that i've i've got a stack of things i want to read to make me a better writer so there there is a lot to be learned you know and and a lot that can be taught but you're absolutely right it's just like the 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 people with an mba in 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 creative writing are not necessarily the guys that are going to write the the, or the women that are going to write the next big book no when, when somebody asks me when somebody says hey i want to be a writer you know what what kind of classes should i take i say take literature learn learn yeah. to read yeah yeah right. it i i learned everything that i do i learned from reading like great writers and 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 mm. then another thing that i say is um it's it's very it's motivating to read really really good writers but it's so much more motivating to read crappy writers that got published <laughs> and you're like oh my god i can do this i can do this if this clown got published and so there was some of that and you know it, was, it took me another 15 years to finish a book so uh you know that's part of it too but i remember that in my 20s you know where i had dreams of being an author and, and i was just kind of like oh my god this guy's so good i could never write like this i was like but this guy's kind of lame i think i can get published um <laughs> So. That's why I hang out with these guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Speaking You're of not kidding. Man. Speaking of Crazy. being a kid and wishing you had paid better attention in English. So who did you read when you were a kid? And the second part of that would be um what new authors that are coming out now are kids and teenagers going to be reading in the years coming? So who's the who's the new talent after uh, after you tell us who you used to read? Yeah, I started out with like Hardy Boys and that sort of stuff. And I, and my dad um, was, he was, my dad was 43 when I was born. I'm 52. So my dad was in combat in World War II. He was an Army infantry wow. Uh, wow. sergeant, um, 60 millimeter mortar. Uh, and uh, so I was always fascinated with the Second World War. He has a, a, a Luger he got off of a Nazi and all this other, you know, which I have now. Um, <clears throat> So I was always fascinated with the Second World War. I lived down in the South, so I was always fascinated with the Civil War, and because um, I'd go to Shiloh or wherever, and I would read a ton of nonfiction about stuff like that. And 
I didn't really start reading fiction. I didn't read the first thriller I ever bought my entire life was Patriot Games, which was the Clancy's wow. oh, third yeah. book or second book. Um, depends on if you count Red Storm Rising. I if think you Red Storm only Rising knew when you read that book what you would be writing. One it's day so now. bizarre, and it, and yeah. it's really too bad that because uh, my every year my dad and I one of us would buy the other one, the the Tom Clancy book that came out for Christmas as as a Christmas gift, you know, and we did that for decades and. Um, and he passed away before I got published, as, as did my mom. And, it, and it's just like, it, wow. it's, it's, as much as my mind is blown, my parents' mind <laughs> has just oh, yeah, been no blown kidding. by this whole thing. But yeah, so I was a huge Clancy fan um, early on. And then I started reading Nelson DeMille, who's magnificent, and Frederick Forsyth, who's magnificent, and um, uh, Ralph Peters, who's not super famous. but No, but he's some, great. He's, he's yeah. okay. All right. I, every time sure. I say Ralph Peters' name, there's like a one in five chance people know who I'm talking about. And I, and I think he's incredible if you read the war in 2020 or you read twilight of heroes or something twilight like that heroes twilight heroes. Thing I read. yeah oh my gosh perfect soldier they're they're they're, they're all it's just beautiful writing like mm-hmm. i have literally photographed paragraphs he's written and, and look at him like a piece of art you know hmm. I, I don't want to step on your answer but he writes literary i mean if you ever want to read literary thrillers Mm-hmm. read ralph peters because absolutely true th- th- there are paragraphs that are just like you said that yeah. i read them and i and i reread them and i'm like that is such a beautifully yeah constructed yeah. paragraph yeah. i can't i can't get over it yeah he, he's explaining what this concrete mm-hmm. block apartment looks like in yeah. smolensk in the soviet union days and 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 you're you're there you're more there than if you were walking through it hmm. um, yeah and, and and it's just an amazing type of writing and 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 also great story you know interesting stories or whatever so um, I was a big fan of him. As far as like who people are going to be reading in the future, that's a God, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think like the Vince Flynn stuff. I think Kyle. Um, I've never met Kyle Mills, but I, I have a ton of respect for him. I I, he, I bought one of his uh, books. It was literally an airport buy, and it's like a oh, four hour flight, and um, <laughs> you know, and it's like oh, I've, I'll see if it's Kyle Mills. He seems like a nice guy or whatever. And I would just read it, and then when I got to the hotel, I read it some more and stuff like that. So it's. He's um, not, by the way. He called security on me in Atlanta. So he's not a good guy. Seen that no, clip yet. I'm totally <laughs> kidding. <laughs> you probably didn't see the bit. You got. I'll have to send you the no, bit. No, I haven't seen the bit. Oh, he's, a he's a great guy. Yeah, he's a good um, guy. Yeah. Yeah, but no, but it, it's like I remember reading that, and I'm going like, wow, that you know the the Vince's estate or you know like Vince's legacy, right. you know it will sort of carry on, and, and yeah. I think that's yeah. great, and that's what I wanted to do with Clancy in the first place or whatever. I don't know. You know, there's, there's, I, I've read a lot of books, you know, that have come out or are coming out that, that I like. But, I mean, it's, it's hard to say what people are going to be reading in the future. I mean, I didn't know people would be, you know, into Harry Potter. So, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to force you to think about this one. Do you have a single moment in your writing career that stands out above everything else? Do you have that one moment that you just say, this is, this is the top of the mountain? Oh, there's so many stories I want to tell. Right. There's so many. Um, I, What's the first one that comes to mind? The first one that comes to mind is being on a, on a, on a destroyer in the fifth fleet out in San Diego and just being taken around, just, just like sitting in the, the, you know, the, the commander, the captain's office. And, and um, they don't call it an office. I've forgotten what they call it. But, um, Officer's mess. Uh, yeah well actually his his like whatever his his office um, quarters yeah i guess so um and 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 just like going through the uh, like a, a destroyer and i i just remember because it was in my clancy days and and you know pretty early on not super early but kind of early on and that um and i remember just being like how am i here it's like how do, mm. who did i trick who have i fooled to get here <laughs> and there's that and then i met a, 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 a you know i met like an intelligence uh, officer guy um in alexandria virginia and it was very sort of cagey like you know leave your phone in your room that sort of thing and you know mm. like come here and then he changed the time when we're meeting and and all this sort of stuff and like we spent 8 hours together sitting there drinking and talking and stuff like that and that whole time i was sitting there going like Oh my gosh, this is a you know, like this world is just so different from what I was doing selling medical devices in Latin America, you know, <laughs> a couple of years before. So there's been a lot of there's been a lot of moments like that. And, yeah. and and none of them have anything to do with like, you know, getting up in front of people and talking or or accolades or anything like that. It's all that like, 
oh my gosh, I've, I've gotten this access to. It's the experiences, bro. The yeah. experiences. Yeah. Yeah. You can't buy them. Yeah. And it's, and it's more fun than writing. We all know that writing can yeah. be a slog. Ru- writing can be great. You can be like where you can't, your fingers can't move fast enough. And you're yeah. like, I'm nailing it right now. But that's, you know, that's one, <laughs> one moment, but there's a lot of moments where you're like, Oh my gosh, I've, you know, I have to put this connective tissue of these scenes together. And mm-hmm. I've, I'm not, I don't even care. It's like, how are the fans going to care? You know, you have to just keep working and working until you find something that, that, you know, is clever and interesting and, and, and worth writing. I think mm-hmm. when we talked last, not this summer, the summer before, when I saw in New York, you had, you were behind deadline and you had like 48,000 words to write. And you're like, I don't know how I'm going to write this. And they want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, <laughs> eventually I did, but I didn't get them on time. That's, um, That's we, okay. We talked before we went, you know, we, we started recording this about uh, my editor, Tom, coming down to Memphis to see me um, a few times. And one of the times he came down, you know, I, th- I think he came down with the message is like, come on, dude, get this. You got this. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I've been behind. I, I think I've been behind schedule for a couple of years because Red Metal took a long time to write. Yeah. And then I've written uh, Gray Man books in, in between and I'm uh, contracted to write a, a, an audio, an original drama audio for audible.com and um so all these projects were just one after the other after the other and each one took longer than i thought it would and then i'm later starting the next one and later starting the next one so i'm finally basically <clears throat> dug out of that i'm i'm about to get back into edits of gray man um <clears throat> late next week but um i I'm, I'm in these like days where you kind of walk around the house like not in a panic about what you're not doing <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, that's a good you, feeling it is a good feeling but at the same time it, it's this empty feeling like it, it, i the had a purpose left. i had a purpose you know yeah. <laughs> and, uh, do, I, do i have a purpose now but no well, that, that, on leads, Netflix. that actually leads in perfectly to what i want to talk about so i want to talk about set pieces and no win situations because um one of the things that i find unique about your series is um the action sequences and the ways court gets out of situations that you just don't expect whether it's the uh hanging by a rope from a micro glider and dead eye or whether it's um being caught by the cartel and um ballistic um you you always surprise me and i'm not very often surprised by thrillers and i think that's why I've, i've been a huge fan of your work um so let me ask you do the set pieces come independently of the plots and do you have like this file of set pieces or do they come as a result organically as a result of the plot you're, you're building? Um, that's a good question. Both. Okay. There's two guys. I've said good question too. So uh, let me make sure. Okay. <laughs> Eric Sorry, and Chris, um, I got you. Don't worry. Um, just hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not that much of a suck up. Um, <laughs> I've already forgotten the question. <laughs> it was such a good question. No, 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 no. Set, what set, are you set, set pieces. I got the question. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, so it's both. Uh, I don't have a file of like saved up set pieces, but I have seen things and thought like, oh, that'd be cool if there's this or there's that. Um, it just depends. It's like um, in, in the book Ballistic you mentioned um, in the, down in Mexico, there's a scene in Puerto Vallarta where there's this kind of a rally and then it turns into a, uh, an assassination attempt and the gray man has to like sort of like slide down these wires and get to this guy and run up this thing. And, and that was literally just lo- being, being at the location and being like, okay, this is where the rally is going to be. And, and I'm like, they're going to try and shoot this guy. And I'm like, what would he do? And then I saw this place where they were doing construction. I was like, he'd be up there and there's these wires. And then he would take some rebar and he would use that as a thing, to, you know? So it was very much, if I wasn't there, I never would have come up with it. Hmm. Um, and then there's, and then same thing. I was in Estonia for Dead Eye, and um, <clears throat> it was in the winter, and there were snowstorms and all this other stuff. And I and I needed a scene where Court and this guy Dead Eye um, escaped from these people, and I, the rooftops were like really. I was like, how could you run on a rooftop covered in ice, you know? And so I came up with this way where they would sort of belay each other on other sides and stuff like that. So that was all very location stuff. I remember. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one of the people that that has written a screenplay for the gray man because it's been in Hollywood for 10 years um, was uh, Joe Russo and the Russo brothers do the the Mm. Marvel movies. And and they um, Joe and Anthony had me come out to to Los Angeles a few years ago. And we spent a few days together before they wrote the screenplay and uh, it was turned into a fantastic screenplay, but then there, they, 
weren't working with Sony anymore. So I think it's kind of dead in the water. Sony still owns the rights, but I don't think that screenplay is, is still in play at all. But um, I, I was sitting there with Joe and we were talking about things and he was talking about, you know, obviously the film world, but he's like, you have to be able to tell stories that a, a writer, you know, like a, a director or a producer can, can read and see as being something that people want to see on a large screen and not on a TV screen or not just in a book or whatever. So there has to be kinetic stuff. There has to be something going on in the upper right and in the lower left. And that's a very visual thing and writing isn't as visual, but that really struck me when he said that because I've never thought like that. So a lot of times I will write um, action scenes and set pieces and I'll, I will say like, let's add it. This is, chaos this is you know a, a, like almost impossible for the hero to get out of let's make it worse let's let's add another level into it so there's always there's a lot of times you'll see in my work lots of freeway action scenes this guy can't know this guy's here while this guy's trying to kill him and he's trying to protect this guy but that guy can't know that he's here you know there all that sort of stuff it, it a lot of that stems from talking to joe and him talking about like you know you know, like filling your screen. And I sort of want to do that mentally a little bit. So that's, I like, I like writing action set pieces. Sometimes um, I catch myself just assuming I'll come up with something awesome. I'll be like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, there's going to be this thing at the end where they're going to, you know, the boats are going to like, you know, go through the air and then they're, and fortunately I haven't done that yet, but <laughs> I need to write that down. Yeah. Write that down. It's a good idea. Uh, um, but you know, it, it comes from that. I remember there was a time when my nephew was really, really little and he had a, a little metal Air Force, he was like two or three, he had like a little Mer Air, metal Air Force One and he had a little metal um, beast, you know, the, the presidential limo. Yeah. And he was like playing with him. He's like putting the limp thing on the back or whatever. And I was just kind of like sitting there and my brother, his dad, like looks over me. He's like, look at Mark. Mark's like, wait, all right, then what happens? <laughs> <laughs> So the presidential limo is on the back of Air Force One. It's like, come on, kid, you're two. Kid, you're chopping Johnny out. Woo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. John, it's very John Woo. So this hey, stuff can come from anywhere. Um, but yeah, I do catch myself sometimes thinking, yeah, when I get to that part of the book, I'll come up with this amazing set piece. And it doesn't always happen. Like sometimes you're like, all right, I have to go back and and find what what would work here. Well, <laughs> let me ask you, Mark. Uh, besides Court and uh, Jack Ryan, who's been the most enjoyable character to write outside those two? Well, it was so much fun to write John Clark. And it's funny because Mark Cameron has said the exact same thing. Mark uh, is the author that yeah. took over yeah. the Clancy series after me. And, and um, he's, it, I've, re I've read his things before and it's like, yeah, we're a total shared experience. Uh, I, 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 John Clark is, was probably my favorite in the, in the Clancy series. Oh, my, mine too. Yeah. Mine too. yeah, yeah. My well, favorite yeah, Tom Clancy character. Yeah. yeah. And, and look at us. We're all guys. I mean, <laughs> 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 um, what a surprise. <laughs> no, I mean, and so so he's he's a lot of fun to write. I I did a whole book about Dominic Caruso, which is just one of the characters is mm, the cousin yeah. of Jack Ryan Jr. And I thought that turned out pretty good, but it wasn't you know like that character wasn't something somebody that I went into interested in you know any any more interested in than anybody else in the series. But I wanted to you know needed to do like kind of a different type of story. So. I don't know. I've, I've written this this audio drama that I'm that I think is is good, and um, and I, I might turn that into a book. I own the intellectual property for it, so I can turn it into a book or a screenplay or something down the road. Mm -hmm. And I like my hero in that. So you know, yeah. I, I'll say what a, a lot of authors say. It's like you know, my favorite thing is my next thing. You know, the thing yeah. that I'm, right. I'm going to work on next until you start it, and then you're like, oh my god, this is just as awful as everything else. <laughs> so, Mr. Clark, we'll go, with Mr. Clark. Yeah, yeah. mine too. Yeah, I'd yeah, I, I have to say that's my answer. So Tom Colgan does not approve of this question, but <laughs> we're going to ask it anyways. Yeah, you, you ran it by Tom. Okay. Uh, no. didn't, didn't run it by Tom. He no. would say no to this one, but we're going to pretend Tom's not going to listen to this. Okay. He probably <laughs> couldn't. He might listen to the first half hour. I think we're good. Yeah, he's yeah, probably asleep right now. We're good, yeah. He's probably <laughs> eating pickles. He's nap time right now. <laughs> he's in the closet eating pickles right now. He's, 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 he's not watching. Oh, God. Um, you couldn't write another novel. What are you going to do with your life? What, what's the next career path for, for you, Mark? Um, I would like to be a scuba instructor, and I'm not even that good a scuba diver. I just think that's the dream job. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the dream job. <laughs> I was on a I was on a dive boat for a week, and the and the like all the scuba instructors that were keeping me alive um, 
were like 23 years old, you know, from, and they were living in the Bahamas being scuba instructors, I guess not making any money. And I was, and I just remember going like, when I was your age, I didn't know that you could do neat things with your life. <laughs> I thought you worked at Applebee's and went to college and they were whatever, you know, it's like, I didn't know that people got to have fun lives. It's like, it's, no, one, no one ever gave me that memo. You know? So I don't know, the, 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 the answer to that question is probably, um, I'd be on the dole or something. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I, I wanted to write. I used to, um, you know, I, I worked, it took me 20 years. I didn't get published till I was 42 years old and started writing when I was 22. Yeah. Um, wow. So there was a whole lot of time where I just wasn't working very hard at it. But then the thing was my career, whatever career I was in at the time, I wasn't working very hard at that either because I was dreaming <laughs> of being a writer. So, um, I used to say, it's like, well, my job, I can phone it in. I said, the problem is, is sometimes I do phone it in and, um, and, you know, cause my, my head is off in these stories and stuff like that. So I, 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 I'm lucky that this is working out for me because, uh, things weren't working out otherwise. Yeah. Well, I'm 42. So you give me some hope. So maybe, <laughs> no, maybe that's fine. my year. You guys are fine. Yeah. I started way past that. Yeah. Oh, Actually, my, so I'm good buddies with Josh Hood and he's, uh, I guess late thirties now, but you know, he first got published in his early thirties and he's had several books out and all this other stuff. And then he's always like, well, I'm not a number one New York times bestselling author. I'm like, well, I'm not 36. You jackass. Yeah, I'll switch. <laughs> like, I was like, you know, the, the greatest moment of thriller fest for me this year was, was talking to John Sanford. And he looked at me and he said, Sean, he said, I had my first book published when I was 47. And yeah. I was like, Isn't that crazy? I didn't yeah. know that. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah. And there's, a lot, my there's life. a lot of people I mean, like uh, that. 54, you assholes. <laughs> I know, but, <laughs> I mean, old? I mean, John, but I mean, John Sanford right. like, is prolific, and you'd think he'd been at it since he was young. Right. Yeah. 47, that's a pretty nice yeah. Uh, number. Yeah, Mike, so I've, I've been in this for 10 years, um, yeah. and I'm exhausted. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you don't need to start early. I mean, you, you're no. just burnt out. I was doing um, some other stuff. Actually, I was working with your counterparts. My counterparts, yeah. Yeah, 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 in the medical in the medical oh yeah device okay. uh, field, yeah, uh, yeah. All right, so let's assume that you've had a successful career at this point. Seventeen <laughs> novels, assume. New York Times let's bestseller. We're just going to put it out there. Okay, fine. Mark's been successful. <laughs> so, um, I guess I want to ask you: At what point did you doubt yourself, or when were you doubting yourself, and then how did you kind of dig yourself out of that hole? Um, I absolutely have this thing you know that i have the imp imposter syndrome where you don't think you deserve to be where you are so that that exists that continues yeah. um i every book you know the thing that keeps me humble is i'm very proud of the books that are published and are out there but the book i'm working on now no, no matter when now is the book i'm working on now is an absolute mm. disaster that's not going to come through <laughs> and it's going to be the one where i get found out and and um and no one in my family will listen to me anymore because <laughs> i've said the sky is falling so many times but the sky is falling <laughs> i mean the, the, <laughs> I, I did just i just I, i'm very proud of the book uh, of one minute out the next one coming out it still needs a, you know some more editing and stuff like that but i i think it 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 turned into what I needed it to be. But two months ago, um, I hated it. I, I, I was like, Oh my gosh, this is, this, this is pieces. And I think it's, um, you hate to say, I hate to use the word perfectionist because that makes it sound like you've done something perfect once in your life. If you're a perfectionist. <laughs> I'm a perfectionist who's never done anything, you know, perfect. But so I really do stress about the things that, that haven't, you know, that aren't the way I want them to be, or I, I don't feel like, you know, like I, we all know where the, our, the bodies are buried in our books, right? We all, yeah. we all know the parts where it's like, I, I thought I was going to come up with something there that was going to be a little bit more clever than it was or whatever. And that kind of weighs on you. So that's when self doubt happens. It happens every book. And you know, what I tell myself now is, and what I, what I told myself even before I got published is like, every time I keep going, I've just left a bunch of other people in the dust, you know? So yeah. if you haven't been published yet, or um, you haven't had the success you want in publishing and you get to like a really hard part in the book and you think, Oh, I should just give up. You know, it's like, yeah, but if you don't, mm -hmm. a million people just let, got stopped at that speed bump. Everybody wants to be a writer. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and yep. you get over that and you've just left all these people at that speed bump. And then you get over the next one and the next one, the next one, pretty soon it's just you and six or seven other people. And, and the, uh, and the market will handle that. <laughs> yeah. You can all get it's published. Great, so great I, I remember telling myself that a lot before I got published. It's like, 
okay, this is really, really hard to get through. And there's so many reasons not to keep going. But if I do keep going, then there's a bunch of people that didn't and I'll still be in the game. Yeah. Good for you. Good for us. Yeah. yeah. True. Absolutely. <laughs> Mark's not a quitter. So, so, so Mark, we've, re- we've reached a point in the uh, evening where we, we have that, uh, that thing that's called the lightning round where yes, I've seen it. Okay. Mm. So, so you know that like, instead of, he's going to leave, right? instead, of, gonna leave. instead of thinking before you speak, <laughs> you have to speak before you think. Oh, okay. And that's what we're all about here. Okay. That's really how we live our lives. Is can I use bad words? Think, right? I, I should have asked before we started. Can I use bad sure words? Sure. You can use bad words. This all is right. all adult television here. All right. all I have a bleed button if I have to. Okay. Eric cannot lose, use bad words and neither can Chris, but Mike and I, yeah, we've earned the right for bad words. So. Okay. That's yeah. right. Because yeah. we're so young? Uh, yeah, hmm. sure. We'll, we'll go with that. I, yeah, we'll, I we'll, will, we'll that. and I'll blame the booze. <laughs> All right, so so I'm going to start since I'm hosting tonight. Um, worst job you've ever had? Burger King. <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> sounds about, okay. Nailed it. <laughs> best be dog breed other than, other than the ones you own? Ah, best dog breed other than the German Shepherd. Uh, or, or ah, yes oh, those yeah, are amazing baby. dogs yeah my dogs are scared of shepherds it's funny my, my older dog lobo is, my dogs are catahoulas yeah uh, and uh and he's always been intimidated by shepherds but i love shepherds all right some of our dogs are gonna be upset at this mike's oh, apparently my, mine, mine is your new best friend i love all dogs <laughs> <laughs> okay so who is your historical hero speak before i think um mm. uh, 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 um you know, I would, uh, uh, Patton, I don't know. I did, Patton was just an interesting guy, you know what I mean? That's a really freaking, yeah, yeah that's like a great him. one. Yeah, he did. Even he, with all his like, flaws, the dude's amazing. That, that's it. The flaws kind of make it, you know, it's like you think of everything from then and it's like, wow, that, that guy was, was kind of. Like, yeah, oh, absolutely. Okay. My son went to West Point um, for a year and then his defensive coach left. He's a football player. Uh-huh. His defensive coach left and the new guy said, hey, I'm not interested in you or 10 other guys. So he transferred, but that first year he did a lot of study of Patton. And, and I love the thing I love about Patton is he finished first in military, first in leadership, second in character and dead last in academics. Wow. <laughs> but it didn't matter. Yeah. His, yeah. his statue yeah. is in front of the library and is facing away from the library with binoculars because mm-hmm. they said, Patton couldn't find the library if he had binoculars. When he stand right <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> Big story. So it goes back to our uh, story about English and how we all sh- should have studied. Yeah, yeah, we should have all studied. I was too. Yeah. This is my morbid question. How do you, how does Mark Graney want to die? <laughs> how do I want to die? Oh, uh, you know, saving a bunch of lives or during sex. Uh, I'll take either. Hey. Both. Saving a bunch Fantastic. of lives, saving no a bunch longer of lives during sex during would be sex. really cool. Yeah. Be- <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to, I don't know how to draw that up. It's well, that guy. sounds like the story. Sounds like a gray man. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you just okay, became a lot then, of people's hero there, Mark. <laughs> my, I'm make that my final question is, can I be a character in the next gray man? Absolutely. You want to die? Yes. Yes. Kill yeah. him. Okay. Kill a great him. death would be yeah. awesome. Yeah, a, a buddy of mine, Mike Dillman, who's a, a, a bookseller in Indiana, and he um, he he likes to be killed in in books. He's always like appealing to authors, like "Kill me in your book, kill me in your book." And I and I said, "How do you want to die?" And he's like, "I don't care." And I was like, "Autoerotic asphyxiation." He's like, he's like, "What's that?" And I'm like, oh, "I got you. Never mind. Never mind. What's that? that? That's the best part of that. I got you. Oh, yeah. We're covered. Yeah. He's from Indiana. Yeah." Well, that, that's well, then that sounds Hoosier. perfect, actually. You can kill yeah, two yeah. Hoosiers with autoerotic <laughs> asphyxiation. <Right there. laughs> Eric, you're up. So, yeah, I'm up next. Memphis barbecue or fried chicken? Barbecue. Barbecue, yeah. okay. Yeah. I, I, I mean, fried chicken's good, but really North Mississippi fried chicken's better than Memphis fried chicken. But I'm, I'm getting in the weeds here a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm talking our language. <laughs> uh, your favorite Tom Clancy novel? I've given him different answers, but I, I will say clear and present danger. There's, I got him to sign one of my books that I've had my whole life, you know, since they came out. Yeah. And the one I chose was clear and present danger. And, it, and, so, and maybe it's because that's where I was in my life. You know, like, you know, like I, I, who knows if it's the best, probably red October might be the best, but, um, but clear and present danger is probably my favorite. Absolutely. Without remorse is the correct answer. <laughs> uh, re- re- without remorse is a great book and 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 everybody says without re- remorse and red storm rising I, red I've storm rising i love yeah. clear and present danger though mm. yeah yeah absolutely 
Um, so Court finds himself in a room with five assassins. Mm-hmm. He can have a number two pencil or he can have a three pound dumbbell. What's he using? Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, I'd go with the dumbbell. Go with the dumbbell. I'd mm. go with the dumbbell. A number two pencil. Is it sharp? Of course. Okay. Of course. <laughs> Does he have a sharpener to where he can be? You know, there's five it was, guys. It was pre-sharpened for him just in All case right. this happened. Is there All a right. Scantron involved? <laughs> yeah. He didn't fill his bubbles in. Um, yeah. No, I would say I would say a three-pound dumbbell, but he would have to do some things where he bounces it off the wall to hit two guys at once or something. There you go. Yeah. It's a little too on the nose for him just to hit people over the head. Yeah, it's too simple. I can't, I can't get away with that after nine books. <laughs> So the most underrated movie of all time uh, for you. For Mark okay. Green. So yeah, the, it's underrated because nobody in America knows it. It's a Korean action film called the man from nowhere. It's like my favorite movie hmm. in the world. And it, I gotta if, find if, it. if, if all, all right. you guys watched it right now and you can watch it for free on YouTube, um, you would if, give it 15 minutes because it starts out looks like it's going to be kind of funny or whatever. It's it's the I I, I showed I told the Russo brothers about it and I was like this is what I want the gray man to look like. This is is gritty. Uh, it's it's about this like former assassin who just works in a pawn shop and he befriends this little girl who gets kidnapped by these people that are like selling organs and it's a pretty awful story. It's like this, uh, but it is amazing action, amazing heart to the story. Just everything about that uh, is so good. And, um, and, and I've, I look at every couple of years and they're talking about doing an, a, a U.S. version of it. I hope they don't because then I don't think they would make <laughs> the gray man because the gray man's sort of about him trying to rescue two little girls. And he's an assassin and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, The Man from Nowhere, it's a Korean film. It's subtitled. We will really watch it. I oh my watch God, Before it. we have Absolutely. you on again, we'll all give you our feedback. Uh, yeah, they yeah, they yeah. should send you a commission check because yeah, they, they, <laughs> they have four views. <laughs> so my final question, and, I, you know, Sean asked a morbid one as well, so I'm not sure what's up with this, but the gray man gets one last meal. What is the gray man eating? Well, I, always, I always talk about him. He'll eat, you know, like cold beans out of a can while the, you know, the people he's after are inside the, you know, five-star, the, the Michelin <laughs> restaurant or whatever. But um, Please don't say he's at Burger King where you were. <laughs> no, he wouldn't go to Burger King. Good. No, he, he's not suicidal. Um, <laughs> kidding. I never saw anything that bad. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, he's, he's a meat and potatoes guy. That's how, that's how I wrote him. You know, he's, he, he, he fires a Glock 19, which is just a simple gun, you know, as opposed to like all the tricked out things you can have or whatever, you know, it's just, he's, he's, uh, he's a, he's a less is more kind of guy. So I, I see him, you know, fish and chips in an Irish pub. Ooh, that's good. Be good. Cool. All right. Michael. Worst thing you ever saw in an operating room. Oh gosh. Well, um, so I probably could, I've never actually been in an operating room. I've been in a lot of cadaver labs. Oh, so it's nice. like training doctors. I wasn't actually training, but sometimes I would help with translations or I was just there because of one of the customers or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, um, I did some lumbar laminectomies and when they, when you cauterize, um, mm-hmm. the, the smell, the, the smoke, yeah, yeah. The smoke comes up into your nose and you're like dead dude smoke in my nose. <laughs> and, uh, it's like, didn't see this coming. Um, I thought Absolutely. that would all be very difficult. I, I, I did walk into a cadaver Big. lab once and it was, um, it was the wrong cadaver lab and it was all, uh, knees. It was all, uh, like legs yep. uh, positioned up. You know, I was like, wow, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm used to like headless, legless torsos and uh, the, the knees <laughs> thing kind of got to me. <laughs> The first time you see a, a face of a cadaver, that's what really freaks yeah, you. The very first yeah. time you see that. Yeah. All right. You can only grab one weapon in the zombie apocalypse. What do you grab? God, like an M60 or something, you know, something with like a 200 <laughs> round box magazine. I mean, zombies come at you, man. Um, uh, yeah, it would have to be something, or God, maybe something that doesn't run out of bullets. Maybe like the, the you know, like some sort of, did, did you guys see Edge of Tomorrow with, with, um, uh, Tom Cruise yeah, and, yeah, yeah, exactly. and Emily Blunt. Remember the Those big sword? Yeah, yeah. I remember the big uh, or the ex- exoskeleton would be the best choice. Yeah. But yeah. the big, the big sword that Emily Blunt carried, it, was, it looked like it weighed like eighty pounds or whatever. It's like, right. That would be good for zombies because it, it's not going to run out of ammo. All right, which branch of branch of service parties the best? 
Marines. <laughs> yeah, baby. I feel like I've got to say that, but I also feel like it's probably true. So. It's probably true because, <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I was there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Favorite dive spot in the world? Well, I haven't been to that many places, but my favorite is the Bahamas for now. I've, I've, I've dove in different place, parts of Mexico and in the BVIs and in the Bahamas. Those are all the places I've been. Like I've gone back to Mexico multiple times and, um, and I've gone to the BVIs multiple times and I'm going to go to the Bahamas in January for the second time. I'm going to dive in Hawaii uh, next month. Um, so far, the Bahamas, the water's the clearest, the, 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 you know, the, the fish. Have you talked to Simon there. yet about that? Yeah, and I actually stayed at Simon's house for a, a few days. It was a fantastic. Nice you know. place. Yeah, it nice is. place. He's a great guy, great family. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I do have to ask this for Simon. Who is your favorite Canadian rock band? Rush. <laughs> I mean, I like Triumph, <laughs> um, but does anybody know who I'm talking about? I mean, we yes. absolutely know, dude. You I love Triumph. Simon. Right, yeah, wait, yeah, yeah. wait yeah. can you say that again? Can we ask that one more time? Yeah, yeah. let me ask you this. Um, Simon Gervais would like to know who your favorite Canadian rock band is. I mean, I've got to say Rush, but yes. I, I was just listening to Triumph um, at the gym the other day. Like I just have like a, a mix oh, I love that of, stuff, of stuff yeah. or whatever. And it's like, I'm like, what? how come Triumph didn't make it bigger? I mean, <laughs> who are the other big uh, Canadian rock bands? It's like, uh, not the Outfield or something? Or they, mm. are they There's only any? Rush. It's just only rush. <laughs> it's only rush. Yeah. You're, you're just yeah. gonna have to ask Simon that when you see him next time. It's on the. It's what, in the what's his favorite? He didn't know. He, he, he didn't, didn't know a single. He didn't, he didn't know, single. know like Rush. It was he didn't know Rush. <laughs> and then he said, "Oh, you guys are probably telling me somebody that's really terrible." <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask well, him what he thought it's, about it. It's never. It's never too late to learn. Our, our yeah. interview. Our interview ended on that note. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, so, Mark, we're, you have to date one. Laverne or Shirley? <laughs> <laughs> Which one was not the blonde with the blue blonde? So um, L- Laverne Shirley. was the, the Shirley has the dark the one that became the, the one that became the director, not her. A uh, Penny Marshall. Shirley. Penny Marshall. Penny Marshall. Shirley. 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 Of course. It's <laughs> but that's that's sort of like by by uh, omission, you know. It's not that I <laughs> want the other one. <laughs> you don't know. All right. Yeah. All right. So um you, you said you read a lot of nonfiction, you know, historical stuff. So let's say you have a time machine. You can go back in history. What time period do you go to? Wow, that's tough. Um, <clears throat> this is going to this is going to be a very weird rando answer that um, I won't over explain. But I was obsessed with the Kennedy assassination for the longest time. So mm-hmm. like the early 60s or whatever are very fascinating to me. Like I'm obsessed about it. Like, you know, I've been to Dealey Plaza like 15 times. I was telling right. somebody the other day I was at Dealey Plaza once telling some friends very much details about what happened and blah, blah, blah. And I look and there were people gathered around me. Like I was a tour guide as I was like walking them <laughs> down. I was like, so here's the grassy knoll. Nothing happened here. They make a big deal about it. Blah, blah, blah. And, and, and like, I had like four or five people from other countries that were like, you know, thought they were on a tour. So I, <laughs> the early sixties are really fascinating to me. Um, I'm sure it was a, you know, if, did if, you ever if, read, did you ever read uh, Stephen King's? Uh, I was about to. I was about yeah. to ask you that. Eleven twenty two sixty three. It was, it was oh, really good. It was really good. Did you watch the? Uh, did you watch the series? Yeah, and then and yeah, then they Franco. had that series. I thought it was yeah. it was done very well. Yeah. yeah, I did too. I did too. I, I, I thought Stephen Hunter did a great a great um, story on the Kennedy assassination as well. What, what book was that? I've read a lot of Stephen Hunter. I don't. Was know he called? Hang on a second. So I'll I'll ask, put you on the spot. Yeah. It, It'll come to me in a minute. All right. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. I'll, I'll ask you another question. question. Yeah. Um, another military question. You have to join the military. So which branch do you join? Well, I tried. To, so I tried to get into Air Force OCS when I got out of college. It was during the Clinton drawdown years. So that's going to be my excuse. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but I tested really well and I interviewed really well and all this other stuff. And I, and I didn't get it. And um, I was just young and a jerk and I was just like, well, forget the military. You know, like I didn't go to the army. I didn't go to the Marine Corps. You know, I was just kind of like, I wanted air force. I didn't get air force OCS. Forget about it. So then after nine 11, I was 31 when nine 11 happened, but I had had a, um, a, uh, a back injury, um, playing soccer and, and a bad surgery resulted in some, some, uh, like neurological deficit in my leg, which is like a permanent thing. But I tried to get into the army. Um, after 9 11, 
um, in one capacity or in, in really sort of any capacity. And, but I was, I wouldn't have been able to pass the physical, the recruiter told me. So, hmm. um, so I, so I, I've tried the air force and I've tried the army. So I guess those would be <laughs> the Marines just seems like so hardcore. I mean, it's like, come on. Yeah, come it's on. hardcore, dude. Yes. Yeah, yep. exactly. It's hardcore. You, you got to hit that when you're 18 or, or not. 18, hit it. Well, no, that's yeah. not true. My buddy ripped that I wrote red metal with yeah. I was 27. When yeah. He, he was it 27? Wow. wow. He was like 27 or something like that. Yeah. yeah. He'd been was, a banker. He'd been a, yeah. he played, um, semi-pro baseball in europe i mean he'd, he'd, he'd done other things before. i was 22 and it was like still like kick right, your ass yeah, yeah I bet, <laughs> so I bet. so mark the next question is multiple choice um there were how many episodes of welcome back cotter 25 <laughs> 55 95 or 115 okay no way 25 because i've seen more than 25 um okay. 115 that sounds like that's a lot of seasons uh 55 nope. 55 no 95 95, 95. Right. Oh, really? I was the next step up was um, it really yeah there were that many episodes Holy yeah crap. and was was travolta in all of them or was he, did he become a big star and then they they got did they get a travolta stand in you know the, <laughs> i think he was in almost all of them I yeah know. yeah i, I love yeah, that show i watched that show great yeah. show actually um and so my last question is give us a movie line that you quote too often. Mm, this is a 44 Magnum, the most powerful handgun in the world. <laughs> <laughs> could blow your head clean off. Jeez. I know what you're thinking. I just not, it's not like, you know, like, <laughs> did he shoot five or did he shoot six? Mm. It, it was like, come to, what is it? What does it say? Like, uh, it was like, you know, be honest with you, I don't know either. Do, do you feel lucky, punk? Do you feel lucky, punk? <laughs> yeah. And then he shoots, and then he shoots the guy, and it doesn't blow his head clean off. Um, <laughs> inaccurate, but uh, but that's okay. He did have another round in the. Tournament. He lied. It's a psychological it, terror, though. Yeah. And the forty-four Magnum had no recoil whatsoever. Mm. Um, yeah. No. He By the way, this, this, one the Stephen Hunter, the Stephen Hunter book was called the Third Bullet. Okay. It's, it's a great like. Uh, Kennedy assassination it's, it's, it's um, subplot type. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Have you ever? You guys know the the book Tears of Autumn. Charles McCrary. Mc, no, uh, not read it. So he, it's it's probably one of the best old American espionage novels of all times. Okay. Um, and it probably came out like late sixties, early seventies. <clears> and it's about the Kennedy. It's not really about the Kennedy assassination, but it's basically saying it, about the Vietnam War in relation. To that yeah. tears of yeah. autumn that's 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 everybody's tears homework you guys will okay. really like it charles McCray, i'm, really I'm writing it down tears yeah, of autumn. yeah writing it in crayon we're recording this fortunately half the joy of the show <laughs> you don't have to write it down <laughs> well mark we really genuinely appreciate you coming on tonight and spending Absolutely. your time with us talking about the yeah. gray man talking about red metal talking about your clancy years um we're really looking forward to one minute out which comes yeah. out february 18th 2020 and we hope to have you on again prior to that if I'd love right. to do it. I love your show. You guys are doing great stuff. And I, I, I have fun every time you put one of those links up, I, I immediately dig into it. Nice, Thanks, nice. I haven't seen the Kyle Mills one yet. That's, that's one that I'm going to have to Oh, watch. you'll like that it's one. definitely worth it. Kyle Mills has some great stories. His, uh, he's got quite the dry sense of humor. That Yeah, mm-hmm. it's pretty awesome, though. Yeah, I saw Jack, and I saw most of the, the, the one with Simon. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Well, we are, we are toasting the gray man. Uh, the gray man. Uh, Thanks, guys. Yeah. I'm, I'm about gray empty, but yeah. Oh, boy. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I want to thank Mark Graney for coming on tonight and being so generous with his time. Go to markgraneybooks.com to check out information on all of his books. And stay tuned for February 18th, 2020, when One Minute Out hits the bookshelves. We'll see you next Monday on the Crew Reviews Podcast. He said the best dog was a German Shepherd. He said favorite, not best. Great is part of my name. That's not a coincidence. I'm proud to be a Border Collie. Oh, you mean open Border Collie. Yeah, do your job. Oh, look, the German wants a walk. Are you an East German Shepherd? Uh, freaking dogs. Okay, so now it's uh, the crew reviews after dark kicks in. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Is he Ralph? And- <laughs> Is he please tell me to <laughs> Our guest tonight burst onto the scene 10 years ago with his best selling Gray Man. 
Okay, I'm gonna stop right now. <laughs> Wait, what color, man? <laughs> well, I need more drink now. Was that that was a Hang full on. bottle? Wasn't it? Okay, so I started out with one Japanese whiskey and moved to another. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mike's having a stroke back there. I gotta wipe the tears from my eyes and go to take two. One, go. Our guest tonight burst onto the scene 10 years ago with his best selling. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Burst on the sheet. Holy <laughs> Jesus, help us. Okay, hold on. Acting face. Lamaze. I'll just do my dead Lamaze. man face. Lamaz. Lamaz. Who said Lamaz? <laughs> Lamaz. <laughs> do they even do that anymore? I don't even know. <laughs> Probably gets medical advice. Excuse me. We should have kept Mark on for this part. That's not going to help. No. Oh, God. Never, he'll never come back. Is he eating cereal or what? <laughs> He's eating no. checks. This is one of the greatest yeah, moments of my life hungry. right now. One, go. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest tonight burst on the scene 10 years ago with his best-selling Gray Man series. And I have no idea what else is next. You know, <laughs> that's it. That's all there is. You did fantastic. Great. Mark. <laughs> Sorry. I surprised you were sober. No, this is way better. Way better. This is way so better. He's like chewing his food like cud. It looks like a cow. <laughs> uh, I'm ignoring you, and I'm focusing. And I'm going to get this done. You, you can do it. You can do it, pal. Are you, are you still recording, by the way? Our guest tonight burst onto the scene 10 years ago with his bestseller, The Gray Man. This best-selling book, Lanny Gr Graney. <laughs> <laughs> Besh, Besh Shelling. You sound like Sean Connery. Don't drink <laughs> anymore. <laughs> He's drinking more. Do I have to call 911? <laughs> Mary! Mary, get down here! Come to the basement quickly. I'm getting Our guest tonight. tonight. Mm -hmm. Who is Do it? tell. I'm curious. <laughs> is that great nuts? <laughs> yeah. No, you can do it. You're already screwed. Don't worry about it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Go. Hey, he's going to do it. He's lining up the shot. He's using a seven iron. <laughs> he's 450 <laughs> yards away. It's gonna be an easy swing. If he throws up, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on the internet. Oh god, don't throw up. He's gonna he's pissing himself. <laughs> you don't pitch yourself. Our guest tonight. <laughs> Cut. Perfect. That's a wrap. I need more I need more food in my stomach. <laughs> you know what the cool thing is? Is I think that is your dog's dish. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need a sponsorship from whatever he's eating there. Is that Alpo or is that uh, Kibbles and Bits? It's really good. Yeah. Too bad we can't go have dinner because we're sitting here watching. The waiting. <laughs> well done. Well done. You did well, Shawnee boy. You I love done. you guys. I love you.